that better now? Lily, is that better? Are you so, are you good? I combed her so her ears would look good this morning too. You look very pretty. <laughs> Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, you know, it had to happen. We're going existential. It, it, you gotta do it every now and then. You know, uh, when you think about um, the dinosaurs lived for 200 million years, and it took a nine mile wide asteroid to wipe them off the face of the earth, uh, and humans have only been around for 50 to 100,000 years. You think we'll make it a million years? I don't know, 200 million years? But despite that, forget all that, you have to, you have to wonder, marvel, at the engineering feat that just happened uh, about asteroid Bennu. I mean, it really, to me, was one of the remarkable scientific accomplishments. Uh, why would we care about Bennu? It's about a third of a mile wide, so it's not nine miles to wipe out the asteroid, like the dinosaurs, but it is on a potential collision course with the, with the Earth. Uh, the odds that it will impact the Earth are about one in 2,700, which is way better than Powerball. So. If you believe in Powerball, you better believe that the asteroid might hit us. Uh, if it does, it's probably not going to do it until 2182, and we have a lot of chance to move it or change its course. If it doesn't hit us in 2182, it has another chance 150 years later. But, you know, scientifically, it is really fascinating. This is the first mission to uh, really sample an asteroid. Uh, Bennu formed about the same time as the Earth, 4.6 uh, billion years ago. And not only did the probe rendezvous with Bennu, it circled Bennu, mapped it out, uh, and even, what's amazing, took a sample of Bennu <laughs> on October 20th, and it just returned that sample to Earth on September 24th to northern Utah. Why northern Utah? I have no idea. If I was going to return it, I'd go to New York City, but it's in Utah. So what's really interesting is when they when the probe landed on the surface to sample it, it wasn't real solid like granite. It was more like loosely connected, like a popcorn ball flying around in, in, in space. But when the sample came back, what's amazing, it's the most carbon-rich and water-rich sample of an asteroid ever detected, which from an evolutionary perspective gives you some sense of how the oceans might have formed 500 million years after the Earth formed. It might have come God bless you, Lily, might have come from uh, asteroid collisions, as well as providing the carbon that led to the formation of life here. So, you know, in, in the greater scheme of life, this was a huge scientific accomplishment for the species of humans to be able to go out and actually uh, find a, uh, an asteroid that might have contributed to the formation of life on the planet. So, big shout out to, to the great uh, engineering accomplishments, uh, physicists and all who were able to uh, to do that. So let's turn to biology, which is <laughs> what we deal with with infectious diseases. But, you know, things are looking pretty good, actually. Um, if you look at COVID uh, hospitalizations, they've been pretty flat uh, lately. You know, the, the major risk group is 65 and older. And if you look at respiratory virus admissions to hospitals, it's still mostly determined by that red line. The black line is all hospital admissions. The red line is COVID. So COVID is still the predominant reason why people are being hospitalized, although the green line shows an uptick in, in RSV. If you look at wastewater across the country, the sampling for wastewater, it's been pretty stable. Last week it was 43% of the sites showing 100% 100, 100 increase or 200% increase. This week it's 38%, so I'd say it's pretty flat. And the BioBot data, which is the CDC data, uh, shows similar, it's a different methodology, but similarly sort of flat, no increase in the total uh, uh, wastewater viral burden. Here in Houston, remarkably, we continue to go down. So we're now at 73% of the, the uh, amount of virus that was here in July 6 of 2020. And that's down from 90% last week. So in Houston, at least, uh, the risk in, in terms of the number of people who are dumping virus into, into wastewater is a lot lower. The, the analysis of what the variants are is about the same, the, first, the same five variants, they shift around in terms of percentage, but they're all about the same. And I just show you this map because this is important for understanding the efficacy of the vaccine. So 
Most of the variants are from XBB. And you can see the major ones are FL 1.5 and EG5, these XBB 1.6. These are the major ones circulating now. The vaccine was directed to XBB 1.5, which is not the dominant uh, species now, but close enough related, we've been saying we think the, va the vaccine will be efficacious. In addition to that, there's that XBB 2.86 we've talked a, a lot about. It had 30 spike mutations, so it's very different, probably uh, similar to how Omicron evolved. It was a concern because it showed up in multiple countries. It's also in five states, including Texas and Houston. But it hasn't outcompeted, so it's not even measurable relative to these other major variants. So I don't think 2.86 is going to be a big problem. But again, if it were, the big con uh, issue has been, will the vaccines be effective? So we now have data for that, and I thought you'd all be very interested in this. This is the Pfizer data. So it looks at the original, uh, just take a year ago, the bivalent vaccine, which was to the original variant from isolated in Wuhan and the BA45 species, it vaccinates people and then looks at the immune response to XBB 1.5, which as I mentioned on this slide, is the one that it's directed to, so you'd expect it to be efficacious. But the question is, how about its efficacy to EG 5.1, that's in green, uh, and to BA 2.6, which is not around, but we're all concerned about. So this is really important data, because what you can see is the new vaccine that's available now is more effective at producing antibody responses to XBB 1.5, which is not surprising, but the EG 5.1, which is the one of the dominant species that is uh, circulating now, but also to BA 2.6. So that's really important. So that shows definitively that the vaccine that's available now is very effective to the circulating variants now, as well as to the potential one down the road. That's Pfizer. Moderna shows the same exact thing. So this is the Moderna monovalent. It's 2XBB 1.5 and does better in comparison to previous vaccines against, of course, 1.5, not surprised, but 1.16 and EG 5.1, which are the dominant ones circulating now, but also the 2.86. So this is the best data that Moderna and Pfizer are gonna be very effective for their current circulating variants, uh, even though it was directed to XBB 1.5. So one more reason why you should go ahead and get your vaccine. I've already gotten mine. I think it's important you get yours. Now, I've, I ask, I've been asked a lot of questions about, well, why did we spend all this time worrying about surfaces and all? And, and you know, it, it really was that the virus mostly, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is mostly transmitted through aerosolization. But there was one study that just came out, which is really <laughs> kind of amazing. They took 36 healthy participants between 18 and 30, and they actually, and these are people who never had COVID, and they actually infected them with a pre-alpha strain of SARS-CoV-2. So it was before the alpha strain, one of the original strains, to see what would happen. And there are studies that are, you know, IRB approved to do this. They're all healthy volunteers. Each was put in isolation, so they were all separated. And then they looked at how many got infected, 50% got infected, and then they sampled air and surfaces to see if RNA could be de detected. This is the question everybody asks, like, was it on one of my groceries? Was it on table surfaces? Well, it turns out it was mostly in air. It was also in the masks of people. But 27% of hands and 29% of surface swabs, you could detect viral RNA. Now, that is different from viable virus. So they also did the study to see if you could find viable virus. Well, it turns out within the first 12 hours of these people being isolated, they looked at all these surfaces, and they could actually isolate viable virus from 13 surfaces, bed tables, bed frames, a bedside table, some remotes on TV, and two, two bathroom uh, handle swabs. So it does show that this is the best study that shows it, that even though we think mostly it's transmitted by aerosolization, within the first 12 hours, people are infected, it is on hands, it is on surfaces, and it can be viable virus. It doesn't show that you can be infected by it, but it does show you can get viable virus on these surfaces, which is really the first study to show that. Now, the one thing that came out of this study is the vast majority of the viral burden uh, was aerosolized. And the other interesting thing is that people who had the most severe symptoms were not the people who, who uh, had the most virus exhaled. It was mostly in the upper airways and the, and the nasal swabs. 
and they had two of the volunteers that actually emitted a lot of virus. Uh, and so that gives uh, some understanding of the super spreader concept that not everybody who had symptoms was necessarily a super spreader, but one or two people who didn't have the most symptoms uh, aerosolized the most virus. So that was really, really fascinating study, answers the questions that many people have asked that we didn't know until this study came out. Now, as far as flu, flu is just beginning to pick up. You can see it's beginning to move up. We're not quite in the middle of the season yet. But the good news uh, is that it's mostly H1N1 and, and Victoria lineage in, in terms of flu, uh, influenza B. So all contained in the flu vaccine. You should be very well protected if you get your flu vaccine. RSV is just beginning to tick up. This is in previous seasons. And you can see in this season, we're just beginning to move up. You know, if it peaks, it will peak in the next month or two. Flu is still uh, on the way up. And in RSV, it's mostly in that zero to four year old group that's being hospitalized. That's because they don't have immunity, which is why it's important for pregnant women to get vaccinated and a monoclonal that's available for uh, very young kids. So I want to end up today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, I uh, want to give a sh big shout out to Sean Zhang, who's been named the director of the Lester Smith, uh, Lester and Sue Smith Breast Center at Baylor. He's an outstanding molecular and cell biologist whose work really focuses on uh, the therapeutic strategies around breast cancer metastasis. So really important uh, uh, promotion for him, and we're great to ha very happy he's doing that. There's also some really cool news uh, that comes out of our teams at the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, as well as our Translational Research Institute for Space Health. As you know, we are the big NASA uh, uh, institution working on the issues of medical, uh, medical issues in uh, long-term space travel. They put together an international team of experts and just published a, a paper in the journal Science that identifies ethical concerns facing future commercial space research. There's a lot of issues with all the commercial space travel uh, and research that's been going on, and so they are addressing that issue in, in, in an op-ed in Nature. And then finally, I want to congratulate Sarah Heilbrunner, who's an associate professor of neurosurgery, uh, and Andreas Tolis, a professor of neuroscience. They've both been awarded grants from the National Institutes of Health on a brain initiative. They're, they're two of 11 uh, major research projects that are supported by this pathway. Uh, Dr. Heilbronner is part of a group of researchers who aim to map the specific neural pathways that generate human behaviors responsible for higher level of functions. Obviously, they won't be coming to my office for that. And Dr. Tolius is leading a group to develop a high throughput method for mapping brain-wide connectivity. And finally, of course, my sister's been after me, complaining constantly that we don't have a decision around uh, Lily's Halloween costume. So today, Lily will be trying on all of her costumes and we're gonna give you an opportunity to vote and she will be dressed up in that costume based on what you say. Anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.